evening. Thank you for joining me uh, tonight for this video teaching. I uh, appreciate every time that you watch and uh, also appreciate when you like and share this video so that all of your friends and family can uh, receive this word, this teaching and be encouraged. I pray as always that you're encouraged by what you hear. Uh, we're in a series, a three-part series called Fresh Eyes, where we're looking at the Christmas story uh, to hopefully gain some new perspectives. I talked about last week how we can kind of look at a story that we're familiar with and just kind of overlook some of the things that are important or even some fresh perspectives. So I hope in this series that we gain some new perspectives on the Christmas story. And I hope that you watched part one um, last week. And last week, we, we, I kind of established that, you know, there are many times that we wonder what God is doing and how He's writing our story. And, and you know, if we're really honest, none of us would write our life story quite how God writes our story. Um, and, you know, if we wrote our own story, we'd write it fairly drama-free, problem-free, full of peaks, no valleys, no pits, and a happy ending, the happily ever after, if you will. But we all know to be true that life does not work that way uh, for us. There are many times where we encounter plot twists and changes and discouragements and moments that test our faith. And when we think about Christmas, our, our minds always go to gifts and presents and, you know, the happy, joyful times. And uh, kids are especially all about the toys and gifts. Um, uh, if you're like me with two young kids, uh, you know that Christmas uh, for an adult, once you transition to being an adult, uh, Christmas really is about seeing the joy on your kid's face. Um, when it comes to gifts and presents, seeing the joy on their face and seeing them enjoy that gift. But, you know, the best thing we can do as parents is to remind our kids that although, yes, we want to give them good things, the Bible even says that earthly parents, earthly fathers want to give their children good gifts. And we want to see our kids happy. We want to see them having fun at Christmas time. The best thing we can do is remind them of the greatest gift, and that is Jesus, to remind them that Jesus is the reason for the season, but sometimes we can look at life through different filters and through different lenses. And uh, some of you might remember the old toy, the viewfinder, and it's the little toy that you put the little circle in that has the pictures and you click the button and the pictures rotate and a new picture comes up and it shows you, you know, whatever it would be. I remember playing with them and they still make them uh, to look more retro. It's kind of an outdated toy at this point, but, but there's still an interesting toy that you can look through and you can see these different pictures and different pictures come up. You know, we have different pictures of life or filters, if you will, by which we view our life. We can view our life through the filter of relationships or jobs or friends or family. And we kind of almost have this viewfinder of life where we put the, the pictures in and we just click it and we can view our life through at any given moment a different filter. We can view the success or the failure of our life the high or the low of our life through these different filters, through our relationships, through our jobs, through our friends, through our family, and the list goes on. But the first point I want to make to you is how you view life is how you do life. How you view life is how you do life. In other words, the filter that you're looking at life through will ultimately propel you to action and put you into, you know, whatever mode you want to be in based on your perspective. How you view life is how you do life. In this part two uh, of, of this teaching, I want to look at the Christmas story from the viewpoint of the shepherds and view their perspective a little bit. Luke chapter 2 and verses 8 through 14 give us this picture of what the shepherds were doing on the night that they were told that Jesus was going to be born. And it says this in verse 8 of Luke chapter 2, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. 
But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom His favor rests. We know that to typically say peace, goodwill toward men. So here's the shepherds, and we talked about last week this angelic encounter between Mary and the angel, and here we have the second angelic encounter between an angel and the shepherds that were living in the field, the Bible says, and they were watching their flocks. These shepherds went from looking at, looking at their sheep, looking at this and at that, to looking up. They, they, they went from looking at to looking up. God had sent this angel. He had brought them a new way to look at life, so to speak. They went from looking at their circumstances to looking up to hear this message, to hear this good news, to hear this proclamation, this declaration that a Savior has been born. Jesus is Lord. He is Messiah. He has come to the earth. They now had a new way to look at life. See, these shepherds in this moment, if you can picture in your mind, if you can put yourself there in this scenario, think about it. You're watching your sheep. You're just minding your business. Boom, all of a sudden, bright light. This angel shows up out of nowhere and begins to declare that Jesus is here. Jesus is born, this Messiah that you've heard about, this Messiah that you've dreamed about, this Messiah that's been prophesied for generations is here. This is an incredible moment and the shepherds I can imagine were in awe at this moment at hearing this message not just seeing the angel but hearing the message that the Messiah was born Jesus was here the shepherds had a sense of awe at this news and I would say that in some ways we've lost the sense of awe this, this sense of awe that these shepherds had at this news. We've lost the sense of awe because, as I said in part one, sometimes we can look at the Christmas story, just kind of blanket and just kind of overlook it sometimes and forget that Christmas is not about gifts. It's not about presents. It's about Jesus. And yes, we love presents. I like to get gifts. I, I'd be lying if I, if I didn't say that I like to get a present and I like to to have something given to me. I like to give things to other people to see the joy in their life, but it's about Jesus. And we lose our sense of awe when we become desensitized by everything else. And I'm praying that we regain our sense of awe like these shepherds to, to hear this good news, to hear that Jesus has been born. He is the hope of the world. He's the light of the world. He is here. He is here. And that's what this angel was saying in these shepherds. They went from looking at their situation to thinking, man, I'm just a shepherd. I'm just here guarding my sheep. I'm just here doing this, doing that. To now they are getting this news firsthand experience with this angel. This angel came to them, to these lowly shepherds, to tell them Jesus is here. How important did they feel in this moment? These shepherds, these are, these, these are guys that normally are overlooked. They're out in the field. They're scooping up the poop and all that stuff. They're, they're you know, shearing sheep or whatever they're doing. They're, they're in a dirty job. But the angel decided, hey, I'm going to go tell them, or, or God sent the angel rather, and he said, go tell them. These guys probably felt like the most important people in the world, that this is news that God saw fit to tell them. And this is news that He gives us every day through His Word to remind us that Jesus is here. Our hope is here. He is here. He is our Messiah. He is our Savior. We need to have a sense of awe to say, Lord, thank You for this. Thank You for this moment, for this sacred moment, for this sacred gift, for the gift of Your Son, for the gift of salvation. So. I'll ask this question, which is bigger in your life right now? Is, is God bigger or your circumstances? What you're dealing with? Because the shepherds had a choice. I mean, I, I would like to think that they would have had a choice to take this message and go, eh, whatever, that's just my mind talking. I'm just tired. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm wore out. <laughs> that's just me thinking. 
uh, that this has happened, this is a mirage, or to say, yeah, this is real. This is real and I need to, I need to consider this bigger than anything else I have. So which is bigger in your life, God or your circumstances? Is His purposes, is His plan, is He bigger than your circumstances? That's the filter we need to look at life through, not, not through the filter of our own circumstances. We need to go from looking at to looking up. We need to go from this place of looking at our circumstances, at our situations, at our current uh, feelings, and look up to the good news, look up to Jesus, look up to His purposes, look up to His plan, look up to His will. Have that sense of awe again of who He is. Um, as a kid, I liked wrestling. Uh, and I know that a lot of kids like wrestling. We like to see those guys fighting it out. I know I did as a kid. And there was one wrestler that I'd never really saw fight in person, but I always heard about. And I know he was a big deal back in the day when him and Hulk Hogan had this showdown. It was Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan. And these guys were larger than life. And as a kid, you know, looking at these big, massive uh, human beings, you kind of get this sense of awe. And there's this picture that I found, and it's going to be there on your screen, but it's of this kid looking up at Andre the Giant. And you can see by the expression on the kid's face, uh, he's looking up at Andre the Giant, and his mouth is open with this sense of awe to see this gigantic human being, this giant of a man. He's looking up, and he's in awe. His mouth is, is just open with this expression of awe of, at who Andre the Giant is. But, uh, you know, the, the facial expression on this little boy's face meeting Andre the Giant captures this sense of awe that we should feel when we look up. When we look up to God, this should be the sense of awe that we have as Christians, as believers, to look at God with this sense of awe, to go, oh my goodness, He is real, He is huge, He is powerful, He could break me in half. This is what this kid is probably thinking, but you know, some are scared to look up. We're scared to look up because we feel that God is disappointed, we feel that He might be angry or even disgusted with you. That, that can be the sense that we get sometimes, that this is how God feels. And when you look at the Christmas story, you see that God went to great lengths to show and prove that He is for you. So we have this mindset to think that God is disappointed, He's angry, and He could very well be disappointed with us at times. But I would argue that nine times out of ten, ten times out of ten, that God has shown us time and time again how He goes to great lengths to show that He is for us, that He is not against us, that He loves us, that He wants us to look up and to look up to Him and to call out to Him and to be in awe of Him. But I want to I point out this again about this photo, that as much as the little boy is, is in the photo is looking in awe at Andre the Giant, Notice how, notice how Andre is looking, looking at the boy or upon the boy with, with a grin on his face. In the same way, this is a sense of how God looks upon us. So, so look at that picture and look how, how the boy is looking up at Andre the giant, but Andre is looking back at him with this, this grin on his face. And, and think of that as a picture of God. I want to paint a picture in your mind that this is God looking at us, that we look at Him with awe and with reverence and say, oh my goodness, how great you are, how great is our God, how incredible you are, you are amazing. And God is looking back at us with this grin on His face, looking at His greatest creation and saying, I love you with all my heart. There's nothing that could ever separate me is, or separate you from my love. That is what God is saying to us today. God is not looking down upon us, which, which would imply a negative uh, emotion. 
But when we look up to Him, God is looking upon us. He's not looking down to us. He's not looking down on us, but He is looking upon us. He is looking at us with favor and with peace. And when you begin to understand how God sees you, you have a fresh perspective. And that's what I want you to understand through this whole teaching tonight is that God sees you as His creation and He loves you. And He decided at this time in this story to look upon those lowly shepherds with favor and with peace and bring them this good news and tell them that Jesus was born. And the angel seals the deal at the end when he says, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those whom His favor rests. I want you to know that tonight, that His favor rests upon you. Have a fresh perspective and understand how He sees you. Understand that He looks upon you with favor and with peace. He doesn't look down at you. God looks upon you and He wants His favor and His peace to rest on you. So I want want to look at two things that we experience when we look up. When we take our perspective from looking at to looking up, there's two things that happen. Number one is we experience God's glory and we experience His peace. In verse 13, it tells us that an army of angels responded to the news. This, this army of angels comes and they respond to this news with these tidings of great joy and great peace. We experience the glory of God when we look up. We, we get a chance to see a new glory and a new, uh, have, a, have a chance for a new awe of who He is. God is glorified because Jesus is born and and peace is spread everywhere because Jesus is received. So when Jesus was born, God was glorified. God was magnified. He was exalted. But uh, peace spreads when Jesus is received. Jesus is that peace that we receive. These are the great purposes for the coming of Jesus. And glory is always ascending to God. And God's peace is always descending from God to His people. That is, the, that is the, the transition right there. Glory goes up to God. When we glorify Him, when we look up to Him, we're glorifying Him. And as we glorify Him by keeping our focus on Him and looking to Him, He sends His peace. He gives us the peace that passes all understanding, the Bible says. So, but here's the thing. Even though God offers peace to all, He offers peace to all. The offer is open to all, but only those who accept Jesus Christ, only those who accept Jesus as Lord and Savior can can fully receive the peace. And we get a glimpse of of this meaning uh, later in Luke 10. In Luke 10, verses 5 and 6, when it says, this is Jesus talking, but whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. So this is basically saying to us that, that uh, uh, peace will rest on a home that has received a son of peace. Jesus is the prince of peace. Jesus is the son of God. He's the son of peace. And when we receive him, peace rests on our home. It rests on our life. It rests on our, our circumstances, even though we might not be able to understand it. And even though things might be rough, even though things might be challenging, there will still be peace. And that is the mark of true peace. Peace exists in chaos. Peace can exist in chaos. Peace can reign in chaos. Um, God offers, God's offer of peace goes out to the world again, but only the sons of peace receive it. So how do we know that we're a son of peace? How do, how do we know that, or you might say, how do I know I'm a part of the group of those with whom his favor rests. Well, it's very simple. You accept the peace speaker. You accept Jesus Christ. You accept the Prince of Peace. But here's the first point to that. Acknowledgement is not acceptance. We can acknowledge him. We can know that he's there. We can know that he exists. But acknowledgement is not acceptance. There's an everlasting peace to come in the eternal kingdom of God. The kingdom of God that comes when when everything is over, but Jesus came to inaugurate or to begin peace for us to live in now. Jesus came to bring us peace now. We don't have to just wait until heaven. We can experience His peace on earth. Peace on earth, the scripture said. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men. This peace 
is not a peace brought about by absence of conflict or problems. Again, peace is not always defined by a lack of conflict or a lack of problems, but it's a peace that's brought by the presence of joy even in the midst of conflict. Even in the midst of conflict, you can have peace and you can have joy because you have accepted Jesus and He brings that peace into your life. Again, when you look up, God is glorified. Glory ascends to Him and as glory goes to Him, He sends His peace down. That is the transition. Glory goes up, peace comes down. We can experience God's peace when we look up to Him and glorify Him. So here are three areas for you to enjoy peace. The first is with God. We want to have peace with God in our souls, peace with God in our hearts. Second is peace with yourself. You have to learn to let go of some things and have peace with yourself. Learn to let go of all the guilt and the shame and the regret. All of that and have peace with yourself and then have peace with others. Have peace with others. Spread joy, spread peace to others. Not just the hippie peace, but real peace. Peace of God. Let the son, be a son of peace. Let peace rest on your heart. Let peace rest in your soul because you've accepted Jesus. See, when the angels declare glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, those are not separate from each other. Those are not separate things. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Those, those are together. God wants to give us peace by being the most glorified thing in our life. If we glorify Him and we focus on Him and we go from looking at to looking up just like those shepherds did, then we are, we are putting God first, and by putting Him first, He gives peace. He gives this transfer of peace when we, when we not only just acknowledge Him, but when we put Him first, when we put Him in His rightful place and glorify Him and look up to Him. See, seven times in the New Testament, He is called the God of peace. Very specifically, He is called the God of peace seven times in the New Testament. So if we want peace to rule our life, God must rule our life. He is the God of peace. And if we want peace to reign in our life and we want to go from looking at to looking up and be at peace and have that peace on earth, we have to let God rule our life. God receives glory and we receive God's peace when we hope and we trust in His promises. The reward of trusting in His promises is peace. And that can kind of seem kind of conflicting sometimes, maybe even oxymoronic that we can trust in a promise and have peace because a promise is something we can't see yet. A promise is something that we can't really tangibly touch, but we can have peace to trust His promise because we know that His Word says that what He has said, He will do. So we can trust God with His promises and the promise brings us peace. Romans 15 and verse 13 says this, I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So here's Paul saying that I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in Him. So here the Word is telling us to trust in God to have peace. The shepherds in this moment, when they looked up and they heard this angel speak to them audibly and tell them that Jesus is here, they had to trust God to have that peace. They had to trust that this was true and it resonated with their spirit. And when that angel declared peace on earth and goodwill toward men, and goodwill toward those whom His favor rests. They had to trust in their heart and believe that this promise was true, that it was coming to pass, that there was a baby that was being born in Bethlehem, and there was a child that was coming to be the Messiah. They had to trust in it. They had to believe in it. So breaking down these three areas of having peace, the first is peace with God. Peace in your life has to start here. It has to start with God. We cannot have peace in any other area of our, of our life if we don't have peace with God. We have to know that we've been made right with Him to have that lasting peace. Romans 5 and verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. So again, it goes back to accepting Jesus Christ, accepting this Word, accepting this good news, accepting the Savior, accepting that He has been born, He has come to earth for us, He has given His life for us. We have to accept Him to have that peace with God because it says right here in Romans 5 verse 1, 
that we, we have been made right with God by faith. And we have peace because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Being made right with God is to be justified. We've talked about that word before. And God's anger with us because of sin is put away when we accept Jesus. When we accept what Jesus has done, the, the anger that God had toward us because of sin, it's put away and we believe in what Jesus did on the cross by, by Him dying for our sins. It's just that simple. And because of what Jesus did, because of what He did on the cross, we can have peace in the presence of God and we can approach Him confidently justified just if I'd never sinned. We can stand before God confidently with peace and with boldness because of what Jesus did. So we have to have peace with God. Second, we can have peace with ourselves. When we have peace with God and we understand that we have been justified through faith in Jesus, we can let go of the guilt, of the shame, of the self-condemnation. We have to let that go. We can, we can also begin to let go of all the baggage and all the burdens, and we can have peace with ourselves. When we know that we've been made right with God, then we can tell ourselves, hey, if He can let it go, if He can forgive it, I can forgive myself. I can let go of the guilt, the shame, the self-condemnation, and I can have peace with myself. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7 say, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is His will for you, to be at peace, to have the peace of God that passes all understanding, guard your heart and guard your mind. He wants you to be at peace with Him, and He wants you to be at peace with yourself. He wants you to let go of the guilt, the shame, and the self-condemnation. And then thirdly, peace with others. We can have peace with others. We can be and live at peace with others. Romans 12 and verse 8 reminds us, it says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Basically what it's saying is we cannot control the response of other people. This life is going to bring us a lot of trouble. People are going to do what they're going to do. And we can't control their response, but we can only control how we choose to respond to whatever comes our way. And Paul is telling us to try at all times, on all occasions, to live at peace with those around us. It's possible. We have to choose it. We have to choose how we're going to respond and what filter we're going to look at life through. When somebody offends us, when we get offended, and when, when things happen and people treat us a certain way, we have to respond accordingly to live at peace with all people. Ephesians 4 and verses 31 through 32 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. See, our ability to walk in peace, our ability to walk and to live in that peace with others fully depends on our ability to look up and be in awe of how much God has forgiven us. That's the whole message of this teaching in a nutshell, is that we begin to look up and be in awe again of what He's done for us and understand that if not for His grace, if not for His mercy, if not for that good news that Jesus Christ is born, if not for Him coming into the world, none of us would be where we are. We're all in need of grace. We're all in need of mercy. So that's why we have to strive to live at peace with others, understanding that the same grace that we need to extend is the same grace that's been given to us by Jesus coming to earth. That was God showing His grace and His mercy to us. So let the Christmas story, let this story remind you that peace has come through Jesus Christ. Peace has come to the world through Jesus Christ and it's available to live in right now. That there is a peace to come in the life to come, in life after life, the second life. There's a peace that comes, but there's peace available now. There's peace available now and we have to strive to live it. Be at peace with God, peace with ourself, and peace with others. Look up to Him, look up to Him. Go from looking at to looking up, just like those shepherds did. Don't let your circumstances dictate your joy and your peace, but look up to Him and let the glory of Jesus Christ give you peace and give you hope. Let Him 
be foremost and be glorified in your life. And you will walk and live in His peace. Amen. I want to pray for you. I want to pray over this word. Father, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you for your peace. I thank you for the peace of God that comes to us through your son, Jesus. God, I thank you for this Christmas story, Lord, where you brought peace and hope into the world through your son, Jesus. God, I pray for each person that's watching, listening to the sound of my voice, God, that you would help us to be in awe of you again. Help us to find a renewed sense of awe of who you are and your goodness and your grace and your mercy. Help us to be grateful and to be thankful for the mercy that you've shown us, God, and strive to live and walk in this peace that is available, this peace that this angel declared to those shepherds on that night, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests, God. Let your favor rest upon us, God. Let your favor rest upon your people. Let us be sons of peace. Let us be carriers of peace. Let us be at peace with you, God. Let us accept fully you and let us accept fully what Jesus has done on the cross for us so that we can be at peace with you. God, let us be at peace with ourselves. Any person that right now is dealing with guilt and shame and self-condemnation, God, I pray that you would just break that off of them and let us live at peace with ourselves. God, let us learn to let go of all of those things that so easily uh, keep us weighted down by the burden of sin. God, free us from that by what your son has done on the cross. Let us trust you to be at peace with ourselves, God, and let us find peace with others. Help us on all occasions to control how we respond and control the viewpoint that we have to look at life, God, so that we can be at peace with others. God, let us put away bitterness and wrath and anger and slander and malice. God, help us to be kind to one another, to be tender-hearted, to forgive, and God, understand that you've forgiven us. God, help us to look in awe at you again and understand the grace and the mercy that you've shown us. Lord, we thank you for your peace that rests upon our hearts because we're at peace with you, we're at peace with ourselves, and we have peace with others. We thank you for your son, Jesus. Let the Christmas story remind us of the peace that comes through him and will never fail to give you the praise for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. I hope this word has encouraged you and has reminded you that peace is available to live in peace to go in peace. Let the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your heart and guard your mind in Christ Jesus. Amen. I want to take a minute to invite you personally to our worship service this weekend at 1030 a.m. We're going to be in person on campus and online. We'd love to see you in person. We're taking every step to make sure you and your family are safe when you come to be with us in person. You can rest assured that when you enter this building, we've done all that we can to make sure you're safe and protected from any kind of uh, germs or virus. And uh, we want you to be with us, but uh, we'd also love to interact with you online if that's how you choose to be with us this weekend for our service. But May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Until next time, we're praying for you. Have a blessed week. God bless you. We'll see you next time.